some uh, sponsor shout outs. Um, I'm a little bit more, I have stuff a little bit better on my phone now, so I can actually read everything I need to. Um, but I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Riverbed. Um, how many people uh, in the audience use uh, Riverbed or App Eternal today? Show of hands. A few in the front. Sweet. Uh, Riverbed, fix what matters. Uh, Riverbed App Internals is a big data APM solution uh, that will help you detect and diagnose the gnarliest of performance issues. Get a free trial at App Internals. Um, it's actually like way before Riverbed, like like seven years ago, um, I used to work on a, like with Panorama, which was like I think many versions behind, and it was it was really useful to like determine some DB issues that we were having. Um, all right, so uh, if folks in the audience use Twitter, um, uh, reach out to at App Internals uh, and then give them a shout out. Um, all right, so for how many folks use Jira or any Atlassian tools? Awesome, a ton. Uh, Atlassian is also a silver sponsor for DevOps days. So deliver fast and reliably with DevOps and Atlassian tools. Uh, experience fewer failures and fa uh, faster recovery by having developers and IT collaborate. Uh, on Jira software and the Jira service desk. Tie automated builds, uh, tests and deployments together with Bamboo, uh, share knowledge with Confluence, and I'm, I can't believe that they forgot to talk about uh, HipChat. So yeah, I think a lot of folks use HipChat and uh, you know it helps you collaborate as well. Uh, and one last one, uh, how many folks use uh, Sonatype? Show of hands, quite a few. Uh, and I know Joshua Corman um, is one of the like leaders in this movement, but uh, Sonatype is on a rugged DevOps mission. Uh, their solutions accelerate software innovation and quality while reducing waste, waste and risk. Uh, Derek Weeks uh, is in town uh, from Sonatype and he'll be giving an Ignite talk on Tuesday. So ask him how you can use uh, Sonatype's uh, Nexus software supply chain with uh, Jenkins, Docker, Jira, Bamboo, Sonar, IntelliJ, or any other tools you use. Um, so you can you can reach out to some folks uh, about that as well. All right. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, transition on. Um, I know with containers, uh, containers started off more as a developer ops thing, and then developers soon started to realize, oh, we need to take this like large app and break it into smaller kind of applications for them to work better. Uh, and then somewhere along the along the way. Uh, that whole idea became microservices, and now microservices, it feels like a buzzword, but really there's like a lot of work that goes um, into that. Uh, we're fortunate here to have uh, Matt Barlow. He spoke a couple of years ago at DevOps Days on a talk that had like a packed audience. Uh, and then he, uh, he works at Rackspace, but also knows a lot about like uh, the, uh, the AWS side of things about you know, building microservices um, and having um, uh, building microservices and you know, kind of like building the infrastructure, infra infrastructure for a lot of that stuff as well. So, without further ado, Matt. Hey, um, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I love DevOps Days Austin. Um, it's a lot of fun and. Um, Really excited to be here. Um, I do work for Rackspace. I work on a product development team. And um, I'm one of the few product development teams that actually uses AWS infrastructure um, because the customers that we um, support, Rackspace customers, are running on AWS. Um, some people may not know that Rackspace um, supports people running on AWS now, something that new um, that um, we started doing um, last year. So. Um, Anyway, so I think about fall of last year um, when AWS announced Python support for Lambda, the team that I work on was like, we want to start building microservices using API Gateway and Lambda. And what I'm here today is to kind of share my experiences um, from doing that. Um, I've had a lot of fun with it. And um, I think it, what I really like about it is that you can go from having an idea to building something out and testing it and sharing, um, sharing it with other people very quickly. So we're going to kind of work through that. And um, these are the main kind of components that I'm going to probably spend the most time on. And, um, and I'll just kind of cover them very briefly, um, what they do and um, what kind of what their place is. So I'll start with Lambda. So Lambda is um, a service by AWS where you can upload your code to it. And um, they're called Lambda functions. You upload them in the form of a zip file. and 
AWS, this AWS service will run and execute the code and return back a response. So it's not really designed for long running tasks. Um, it's, and it's not really designed by itself for stateful things because it's just gonna run on some container or some VM um, in, under their control and return a result back to you. Um, and so what I'm, you know, so one of the choices for data is to use DynamoDB. DynamoDB is a schemaless database. Um, it, it doesn't work for every situation that you might be in, but for what we're gonna talk about today, it works fine. And you don't necessarily need to use DynamoDB if you're building a, a microservice with API Gateway and Lambda. You could use a different type of data store. Um, you could use even um, EC2 instances or whatever else you need to do. Um, but for what we're talking about um, today, DynamoDB works pretty well. API Gateway, I think like Jeff uh, from AWS mentioned yesterday, it kind of goes together with Lambda, like peanut butter and jelly. And API Gateway takes um, the place of like what traditionally might be your Nginx server, for example. Um, it's where you define your routes. And um, when you build the API Gateway on AWS, they're gonna give you a URL. And um, you can set up Lambda to be the back end to it. So Lambda on its own, you know, it's event driven like code execution. So you can trigger it with things like an upload to S3 or a change in a DynamoDB table. You can have those things automatically run your Lambda code. But in order to have it respond to HTTP web requests, you need API Gateway in front of it. And the last thing is Swagger. Um, Swagger is called um, Open API now, but most people still call it Swagger, and it is really, really awesome. Um, Swagger is a spec file, and it describes your API. You can write it out in YAML or JSON syntax, and once you've done that, what's so powerful about it is that it automates a lot of things for you, um, and keep make sure that they're all in sync because they're all being built from the same spec file. So you can um, auto-generate your documentation from it. You can, this is a screenshot um, under monitoring tests of software called RunScope, which we use for API monitoring. You can import it, import your Swagger file directly into RunScope. Um, you can validate your API with it by running tests. Um, and you can even generate, this is a whole list of client libraries on the left that you can auto-generate from your Swagger spec file. And that same file, is used to configure your API gateway. So on our team, we never edit API gateway directly. Um, last I checked, which it may have changed, but last I checked there was no CloudFormation support for API gateway, even though they have CLI support for it now. But even if there was, we would not use CloudFormation to manage API gateway because we use Swagger um, to define API gateway. And um, we use that same Swagger file to get it, to have it imported into our monitoring and documentation and um, even generate tests from it. And that way we know that um, it reduces a lot of extra work for us and, and um, we know that everything is in sync. So today I want to walk through real quickly the um, build out of kind of a toy example microservice. And, um, on our team right now, I just want to clarify that even though this is sort of a not much more than a CRUD type application that's doing a little bit of work on the back end, um, you can use this to, um, you know, for more complex services as well. Like on my team, we have um, SSL management microservices, auth microservices, um, services relating to um, build services and release and so on um, that are using SQS and worker nodes and everything else. And they're still following the same structure that I'm gonna um, show you today and using the same templates that I'm gonna share today. Um, but they have more, um, just more infrastructure running on the back end. So I don't want you to think that you can only build out like rinky bean type services with this. Um, but then again, um, I also have to say on the other hand, it's not the best choice for everything. And that, that should, should be obvious. Um, so today, the idea is if someone on your team were to come to you and say, I want to be able to run a Lambda function at some time in the future. Um, I want to be able to run it one time and just schedule it and not have, not have to think about it again. Um, and it could be a year from now, it could be two years from now, or a week from now. I just want to schedule it. Um, that's the kind of example that I had thought of um, that we could put together. And it reminds me of the at 
command, um, which is not necessarily a really well-known command in Linux and Unix. It's kind of like, um, I don't know, Cron's uh, little stepbrother or something, but you can schedule it and it will run, run one time. And when I was putting the talk together, I found that the at command first showed up in 1979. It was part of Unix version 7. And I even looked in the manual, and um, I saw that there was a bug section that says that there may be bugs in scheduling things almost exactly 24 hours into the future. So, I don't know, you had one job at command. Um, um, so the first thing that we, we're going to do after we have an idea of what we're going to build out is just do some basic whiteboarding and think about what are our paths going to be. Um, so I have a slash ATQ for the at queue. That's going to list all of our at jobs. Um, if we post to that same endpoint, we're going to create a job. Um, and then we can get one with the ID or we can delete one. And then the next thing we're going to think about is our object definition. So what are the properties of our data structure? Um, and these are going to go into Swagger so that um, we can define what the responses are going to be, what the HTTP responses are going to look like, and what we expect when someone's posting to our service. And what we've got here is if you're just requesting, we're going to need to know the job ID. And the properties are job ID, lambda arn, and the time that we want it to run. If you're posting a new one, then these required fields flip. Um, if you're going to create a new jo at job, we need to know the name of the Lambda function, which is the Lambda Arn, and we need to know what time you're going to run it. And we'll generate an ID for it. And this is the last thing that we're going to do for design, is just spend a little bit of time thinking about um, what's the code going to look like. And um, for this, like, the list and describe is pretty simple. We're just retrieving the data out of DynamoDB. And in fact, in a couple minutes, I'm going to show you how um, you don't necessarily even need Lambda when you're querying a single item out of DynamoDB. You can proxy from API Gateway directly to DynamoDB and, um, and bypass Lambda altogether. And I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. Now, for the create job and the delete job, there's a little bit more that we have to do. And um, because we not only have to save it, we have to actually schedule it to make sure it runs at the time we said it was going to. And the approach that I would take here is there's something called CloudWatch Events. Um, it's designed to run things on scheduled intervals. It can run Lambda. And um, it accepts a cron format for input. So what we're going to do is just send we're going to take the date time that was sent to us uh, from the client, and we're going to s reformulate it into a cron entry um, that has the minute, hour, day, and the year, um, so it'll only run one time. And then likewise, when we delete it, we've got to d uh, make sure we delete the CloudWatch event rules and targets, as well as the DynamoDB item. So that's all the design that we need to do to get started. And the first thing that I would do is um, I, I threw together some templates. Just These are things that I pretty much already had on my workstation um, and that um, has kind of come up since we've been creating a lot of different microservices. And um, I genericized them and put them, in, um, put them on GitHub. So you're, you can feel free. I've got links at the end of my talk. You can download these and modify them. And what they are is... Um, I'll just kind of walk through um, the structure of it really quickly. Um, you've got your Python code right here, um, which of course could be Node.js or Java, which are also supported in Lambda. And um, right now it's named service slash service dot pi. We're going to rename that to at slash at dot pi. And um, your Swagger file down here is, um, it's just filled out with some kind of generic information. They also have um, some sample templates if you go to editor.swagger.io. They have a bunch of um, sample templates there as well that you can look at. Um, there's only a couple sections in the Swagger file that we're going to change um, to get started with, and I'll show that in a second. But the main files that you're going to be working with is your code, which corresponds to Lambda, and the Swagger file, which is your API gateway. And um, the, uh, the rest of these are mainly playbooks. So the deploy playbook is going to provision all of our infrastructure. Okay, So I'm going to demo that in a second. It's going to build out our API. It takes you know, maybe three or four minutes the first time that it runs to set up API Gateway and Lambda and all their policies and everything else. 
Um, the version playbook at the bottom, um, that is basically just going to version Lambda for you. So once you've deployed your infrastructure and you're just working on editing code, you can run the version playbook and within a few seconds, your code will be updated in Lambda and you can start using curl or postman or whatever you use to hit the API and immediately see the, the results from that. So remember we talked about these just a few minutes ago during the um, pseudo whiteboarding session where we laid out our operations and, um, and paths. It's pretty much just a direct copy paste now into the Swagger file. If you, when you look at the Swagger file, you're gonna see a section for paths. And what we've got here is our, um, our resource path slash ATQ. We're doing a get operation and um, Here's a snippet of our response. So a 200 response is going to list all of our at jobs. And what it returns is an array of at job items, at job objects. And we're referring to that, which is further down in the file. You'll see our job definitions. We only have one job definition. We have, um, it's an at job and it has these three properties, job ID, lambda arn, and time. And um, that's the same structure of our, of our DynamoDB schema, as well as the response and, um, that we're returning back to clients that call this. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, demo a deployment right now. And just run the Ansible playbook with this prefix and so this is running now, and the, the reason that I have a prefix here is because everything that this playbook creates is gonna be namespaced. And um, this sort of takes the place of a Docker Compose um, when you're working locally on your laptop and you wanna have your service running for you so you can interact with it. This is actually deploying it on AWS, and, but everything is gonna be prefixed in namespace so that even if you have a lot of developers working on the same code base at the same time, um, these are designed for short running, you know, playground instances of your API. Everybody can deploy them with their own prefix and you won't, um, you won't conflict with one another. So um, what this is doing right now is it's building it with the prefix of DevOps days and it's going to start by zipping up my Python code and uploading it to the Lambda service. Um, now a quick note about that is the way that works is um, Lambda doesn't have like any concept of a pip install or, or installing packages or um, whatever you may be using to, for dependency management. Like Lambda expects all of your code and its dependencies in the zip file. So it's in your best interest to keep those zip files in your code dependencies as small as possible when you're using Lambda. And um, one of the reasons for that is because um, in Lambda you have what are called cold starts and hot starts. So a hot start um, is going to be um, when the code's already loaded, initialized in memory. Um, AWS is gonna try to keep you on the same container, same VM as much as possible. But um, if your API is accessed kind of infrequently, or if there's a scale out event, or for whatever reason there might be, um, you're gonna go through a cold start, which means that the code is actually downloaded from S3, it's initialized into memory, and that can take a few seconds. Um, so you want to try to keep your zip files and your code, um, your code base as small as possible. And one way that you can do that is by narrowing down your dependencies and requirements. So a quick tip about that is that um, the Lambda environment already has the SDKs built into it. So if you're using Python, you're probably using Boto3, um, which you, can, you don't have to include those dependencies um, when you're zipping up your Lambda code. So you don't have to put Boto3 in the requirements.txt um, file. And likewise, if you're using Java or Node.js, the SDKs already live in the Lambda environment, so you don't need to zip those up um, and, um, when you're working with uh, Lambda. So what it's gonna do is it zips up the Lambda code, initializes the Lambda function, sets up API gateway for us according to the Swagger file that we created, and then sets up all the mapping templates. And right now, it's just finishing up, so in that amount of time that I was just talking, um, it pretty much built our entire um, API with our initial changes to it. So what I can do now is um, go to Postman and delete this one real quick. 
and I can import my Swagger file. And you can see that all my requests, so what happened was when I created the API Gateway in AWS, it generated a URL for me that I can use to start interacting with it immediately. I can take my Swagger file and immediately, this is like running curl or, or what, what have you, but I can save these collections with other people and I can immediately start making requests to the API. Um, now the only code that I have in the templated out Python file so far is logging the CloudWatch logs, so it's not returning anything. But speaking of that, I wanna show you another really um, cool tool that you can use, which is called AWS Logs. It's a, um, Python module that you can get with, uh, with just doing a pip install AWS logs. And what I can do is start tailing my log group. So this is the request that I just made through Postman. And, um, and then I can just kind of go back and forth and send requests to it and then see the new request. So you see this request ID down here this is something that, the request ID is a header that gets added by API Gateway, and since we're doing you know, log aggregation for all the requests that come into this Lambda function, we can trace the execution of an individual request. So I think this tool is really awesome, this Python module, um, because it mimics the tail-f behavior that we're probably used to. Um, and a last note about log aggregation, I really like you know, the way that Lambda, um, you don't have to think about log shipping or anything like that, it just logs everything to CloudWatch logs. But if you have a lot of Lambda functions, a lot of, um, a lot of microservices, then what we do on our team is we actually stream the CloudWatch logs to an Elk stack where we aggregate all of our, um, all of our logs. So um, this is a better formatted copy of the event object, and I'm gonna explain how we got to this in a second, but um, this just shows you like, this is the data that is available to our code now um, to, to work with. We've got the, request, the post body, the path params, query params, and all the headers that were came in with the request. So this is really what's kinda happening um, you know, on, a, on a higher level. Uh, the client makes a request, and the, the integration request is, is hitting the backend Lambda code. So the request comes in, and when you make a request, you're gonna have the query parameters, path parameters, headers, post data, and so on. And what we're doing is, all API Gateway does, all it is behind the scenes is an API proxy. All it's doing is taking that request and reformulating all the data that it has from that request and posting it to a backend service. In this case, it's posting it to Lambda, our code receives that request data, we do a bunch of stuff with it, and then we send it back to API Gateway, who takes our response, manipulates it again, and reformats it into a response for our client. And in our case so far, we're not actually doing anything with it except dumping the whole event to CloudWatch Logs. So here it is, this is the actual request that I copied out of Postman that we were sending. And this is how it's mapped to the backend object. This is the proxy portion of it. So this is, um, this is called VTL, it's Velocity Template Language. And um, this lives inside of our Swagger file. And in our get section, um, we're basically just looping through the different parameters and reformulating them into a new data structure. This is my Python code. So what, in, in Lambda, you tell the Lambda service what function you want it to run as an entry point. It's gonna run Lambda handler and it's pass we're passing in that event object. And you can see the only thing that we're doing is logging it straight to CloudWatch so far. And this is a screenshot of CloudWatch. So now let's talk about actually editing some code and doing something useful with all of this. Um, now, this is the kind of dev um, workflow that I will normally work through. Um, so I've got my editor open, and I work with a lot of AWS services, so I've got IPython open, and I'm working with the um, functions directly against AWS services. And when I think that everything looks pretty good, I'm gonna run that version um, playbook that I showed you earlier. 
refreshes the API, I'll start making some requests, parsing logs, and then just kind of repeat that cycle. This is a lot, of, a lot to go through, but um, basically, if I'm gonna get started with something like this, I'm probably gonna start with the create. And all I'm really doing here is just writing to DynamoDB, and then I'll be adding in my CloudWatch rules and targets later on. And this whole finished example is available too, so when we're done, um, you'll have the links to go see like the finished um, example at microservice as well. So once I've made some changes, it's just a matter of um, running the version playbook, and this only takes a few seconds. Um, so when you're making changes to anything relating to infrastructure, you're gonna be working with the CloudFormation template um, in, in this directory if you work from this, these templates. Um, so that's like if you need to give access to S3, if you need to add EC2 instances um, or SQS or whatever you may need to do, um, you'll work with the, or make changes to the Swagger file, you'll work with the deploy playbook. But the version playbook is just for making code changes and you can see that it's very fast that it already released a new version of my Lambda code. And now I can open up Postman and I can send in example post data. And then I get a response back um, and then check DynamoDB and I can see that it actually persisted to DynamoDB. So this is the updated um, life cycle for, for a post. So now everything is the same as before, but instead of just dumping things to CloudWatch logs, we're now scheduling things in CloudWatch events and saving the Dynamo to, D, to Dynamo, or saving the data to DynamoDB. So let me talk about the responses now. That first get request that I demoed out, um, it wasn't returning anything. Um, so it was defaulting to a 200 in API Gateway. But now, um, what we're gonna be doing is, we wanna make it so that if you query DynamoDB and that item doesn't actually exist, it should return a 404. So we do that through exception handling in Python. Um, and we raise an exception if the DynamoDB item is not there with a message. That message string exists in our Swagger file and in the mapping for API Gateway. And it sees, if it sees something that starts with a 400 and a message, it knows that that is a 400 um, status code and, and the return with that. So like I mentioned earlier, um, part of what we're doing so far is a little bit inefficient um, because when I said that API Gateway was just a, was really like an API proxy, um, we're basically taking a request on a get and proxying it to Lambda. Lambda's taking that event object, calling DynamoDB, getting a response, returning it back to API Gateway and back to the client. Um, those are extra requests involved in there. Um, what we can actually do is why not just go directly from API Gateway to DynamoDB? And you can do that. Um, you can, it doesn't work for everything. Like for example, um, if, you, if we're doing our list of all of our at jobs, um, DynamoDB has a limit of 100 um, items that it can return at once. So there's gonna be paging involved there. So we're, um, we're not gonna be able to just, we, we are gonna need Lambda and Python for that part of it. But um, for something that's just a simple um, get request of a single, um, single item, we can just query DynamoDB directly and this is how we do it. Um, we basically, if you look at this part under application slash JSON, this is taken from the Swagger file. And <clears throat> you can see here that this is just a DynamoDB query. We're querying, looking for a job ID equals the path parameter of ID. And the format that we get back from DynamoDB is um, kind of funny. So we get it back and we reformulate it into the response that our client expects. So since I've demonstrated like how easy it is to build these environments and tear them down, and you've seen that it can happen pretty quickly, um, this has implications for our um, continuous integration and CI, which is that what we do on our team is um, when you push, a, you know, what I've kind of demoed so far is each developer working individually, kind of testing things out, but when you're ready to actually push your changes, you can have um, the whole microservice um, provisioned and you can validate the API calls on it. 
and then destroy it when you're done. So what I've been using lately is a um, mo module called Flex for this. And here's how it works, is that um, we're going to build that microservice in, um, we're using Circle CI, but you could do the same thing in Jenkins or another tool. But we're going to build out the microservice, and we're going to load the Swagger file into memory, the schema, and then we're going to hit our paths, and we're going to make sure that not only do they return something, but that they actually um, match what we said they would in the Swagger def. So this is a really good way to make sure that you're keeping up with your contracts and that, um, and that you don't have any regressions there. So um, that's basically how we, um, you know, how we do some of our testing. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is um, auth. Everything that we've talked about so far is basically open to the world, right? So um, it's, um, at some point, you're going to have to probably um, make sure that you can identify people and, um, and limit access. And there's a couple of options that you have here. So right out of the box, um, API Gateway has support for API keys. Now, these aren't really useful for, um, for user management, um, but, they're, but I do encourage you to use them when you're just kind of building playground environments in order to avoid them having them open to the world. Um, you can just put an API key in front of it, and um, that will limit the access. You just send it through as a, as a header um, when, you're, when you're accessing it. But again, it works on the entire um, stage of your API, and if you have a lot of microservices, and uh, the way that it's designed is it's not really a good choice for kind of um, user management or anything like that. It does have support for IAM, but working directly with IAM um, is uh, kind of a beast, and um, it's very flexible but, and very powerful, but um, I've never seen anybody using IAM just by itself to manage all of their customers without something like Cognito. Now, in our case, um, we already have an identity system at Rackspace. It's called Cloud Identity. And our customers are Rackspace customers, <clears throat> so they already have a token. They've already signed into our website. And this is how we, um, how we, how we work with authentication identity with our existing identity system. This is a lot to take in, but um, Lambda, the key point is that Lambda is very, I'm sorry, API Gateway is very flexible with the ability to give you custom authorizers. And what that will do is it will run Lambda code to authenticate and authorize um, your clients. So the way that we have it set up is that um, a client has a token that they've received from Rackspace. They hit an auth, point, an auth endpoint in our microservice. We validate it and generate a, J, a JWT, which is a JSON web token. We respond back to that. And then on subsequent calls, we're going to intercept the custom authorizer in API Gateway. This feature of API Gateway will intercept that um, request, and, it, and we'll, our code will validate the JWT, and we return back a temporary IAM policy for them, which gets cached and um, allows uh, the request to go through. <clears throat> so auth is something that we probably spend too much time, um, too much time talking about, but <coughs> on our team at least. But um, this is the system that we've got in place today. So that's pretty much what I had for everybody. And um, I'm just basically here because I've been, we've been using this on our team um, since about the fall of last year. And I'm having a lot of fun with it, having a lot of fun automating it. And um, I, it works for, not for everything, but it works for some things. And um, if you have an idea for a new service that you want to try out, I would encourage you to at least check out this option. Feel free to download these templates and um, play around with them. Hit me up if you have any questions about them. And um, that's pretty much all I have. So thank you. Okay, uh, so the question is, have we had customers that um, we've helped split their apps into microservices? Um, well, we've done it ourselves. That's, we're the only, only one um, that I'm aware of um, on my team personally, is that we had a monolithic web app, um, and it was running on ECS before, um, which is Elastic Container Service, 
And um, <clears throat> it was a Python app that had worker nodes and front end and, and that kind of thing. And um, we've been splitting that up into microservices. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and uh, I'm not really sure about any tools necessarily for that, except the ones that we've met, that I mentioned here. But our approach was um, to kind of diagram everything out and split. <coughs> we actually had a team of about 15 developers, and we split it into three sub teams, and we've each taken on different responsibilities. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, okay, good question. Um, so w so the question is, um, how do you handle conflicts in resources, like AWS resources? Um, so the kind of the account set up. And right now, <coughs> excuse me, um, we do have one product. We are using one account for production. And all the microservices are deployed in that single account. So we've had different talks about, like, should we split them up per AWS account? We do use a ton of AWS accounts. Um, and we have different accounts for dev and different staging, which is what's normally recommended by AWS. Um, but our prod account is, um, we're running um, on there. But like I mentioned here with the prefix, one key that I have for everybody or a tip is that always dynamically name things. Use CloudFormation for everything and always allow CloudFormation to create the name for your AWS resources and rely on refs and outputs um, to wire everything up because um, it's a, so that way when CloudFormation creates it, if you don't provide a name for it, it will give it a unique name. And if you try to name things the same, um, you'll run into propagation issues as well. Um, when you try to delete resources and recreate them, um, like for example, an S3 bucket or an EC2 instance or a Lambda function, no matter what it is, if you try to delete it and recreate it too quickly with the same name, sometimes it will fail. Um, so. If you do that and you use kind of like the prefix, and like I mentioned here, then all of your resources will be created and kind of namespaced and wired up separately from, from one another. Um, go ahead, I think you were first. So um, I think your question is, the question is, um, how do you kind of circulate um, kind of uh, new modeling and ways of doing things with the rest of the team so that people don't kind of reinvent the wheel? Um, and the example was like when we bypass Lambda and use DynamoDB directly. Um, so the way that our team is structured is that we kind of have three sub teams and each team is responsible for um, different area of responsibility. And um, the, uh, so in, in the way that we kind of communicate things like that, so there is some autonomy. Um, like I have certain, uh, the team that I work on has kind of a, a t some autonomy over the site, the services that we manage. Um, and we're very, there's only four or five of us and we're in Slack and we're communicating all the time. So, and we do code reviews. So there's really no, nothing that goes on that's kind of in isolation. Um, in terms of circulating things with the rest of the teams, um, we're pretty good about just uh, kind of explaining kind of what we're doing and show, showing what we're doing. Um, but uh, yeah, that's something that we, we really haven't run into too much of a problem yet um, in, in terms of like if somebody does have a really good idea then, um, and they want to share it with everybody else, they're pretty good about, about sharing it and everybody will kind of follow, follow suit. Go ahead. Absolutely, yeah. Um, well, I didn't actually set it up myself, but um, we ha we're using like the, the main Swagger doc gen site, the same one that runs editor.swagger.io. And um, our UI people have done some work on it to give it more of like a unified look for us. Um, but um, that's what we're using right now. <coughs> 